Good enough. Good morning, church. Okay. Good morning. A wonderful Sabbath day. It feels like summer. And we've got a lot of new people here, and a lot of people are visiting. And our pastor's on vacation, too. But uh, so hopefully, hopefully I'll be a, a decent substitute. So when I was uh, about, about, when I was a little boy, um, there was two things that I remember I wanted to do. Number one, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Have you guys seen the new Top Gun movie? Who's seen that? I mean, that was, was that incredible? Man, don't you believe it? I was, I was not crying at all during that movie. The other one that I wanted to do was I wanted to be an inventor. And I remember sitting in bed and in my, my room, and I would, I would think of ways that I would keep my brother out of my room. I would, I would have this electronic lock that only I knew the, the, the key. And uh, they're, they're waving at me to move my mic a little bit, so hopefully that's good. And, and so I would, I would think of these inventions on my bed, you know, like, or maybe there would be a camera that when my brother came in, it would, it would send some, some water down on him to keep him out, or an alarm. So I wanted to be an inventor. Well, as I grew up today, I am not a fighter pilot. I wanted to be one, but it didn't work out. Um, but... I would say that the job I'm doing, I'm kind of an inventor. And I, do, I work for a company and I do product development. And we, our job is to come up with kind of new things um, for new products that people want to see. Well, I also like to work out and tinker in my garage. Some of you guys know about all about my garage. I talked about that before. I like to tinker in my garage. And about eight years ago, I, had, I was looking on the internet in my garage, and I came up with some open source software that I found on the internet that could do voice recognition. And open source software is free software that people give out available, and the idea is that people will build on those ideas and build something better. And I said, I have a great idea. I'm going to build this small computer that could be voice commanded, and I could give voice commands to it. And what I did was I built it up using a, a computer called the Raspberry Pi and a speaker and a microphone. And the first thing I got it to do, if, to those that know me, is I got it to tell me the surf report. And you guys know all about how to do voice recognition today, but at the time, the name that I used was Erica. I said, Erica, what is the surf report? And Erica would give me the surf report. And then I came up with this killer application, in my mind, killer application. And that's another name for, hey, the best application that, that I could use this. You know, not many people like the surf report, maybe, but many people might want this other application. And I thought, ah, this would be great. I'll put it in the kitchen, and it would be a timer so that myself or my wife were in the kitchen. And instead of having to pull out our smartphone, we'd say, Erica, set the timer for five minutes, and it would go off and, and do the, the time and give us an reward. So that was cool. That was really cool. And I did it. And I came up with a new thing. I said, um, I, it was basically working. It's not super great, okay? But, but then what I did was I came up with a new generation. I said, I had all these parts, and I was going to put it into the cylindrical coffee. It was like a cylindrical box that would have the speaker and the microphone and the computer inside. And I thought, and I drew it up, and I put it aside, and I got busy with work. And then, three months later, Amazon comes out with a speaking computer. I go, oh, that's cool. I've done that. And they came out, and um, you don't, it doesn't say, you give it commands by saying, instead of Alec uh, Erica, you give it Alexa. And I go, hmm, that's kind of good. Well, they're on the right track. I like that. And then I looked at it, and it was the Amazon Echo. You guys may know this. But it was about a tube that was about this strong, high. And I go, man, did they copy me? Did they copy me? And then one of the applications that they said that they wanted to do, that they advertised, was in the kitchen. You could say, Alexa, set the timer for five minutes. <laughs> I go, man, I don't like this at all. So I didn't buy, an, I didn't buy, an, I didn't buy an Amazon Echo for at least two or three years. But... In my house today, I have three Amazon Dots. Okay, they shrunk it down, they got Amazon Dots, and I use it, so. Basically, did they steal it from me? No, they out-innovated me. They out-innovated me. 
And some of you guys may be inventors. I know my good friend Charles is an inventor. He's an inventor. And you guys may do it. And, and oftentimes we get out-innovated. But today we're going to talk about something that we can all do. And we can all do it. There's no competition. And we can each be innovators for Jesus. And before we start, um, let's, let's bow our heads in prayers. Dear Jesus, we're here today for you. We've come together as a church family, this church family that's here. Help us to, to hear your message. Help us to view each one of us, that each one of us gets that special part that helps them for this day. It helps it not only for this day, but to also share with others um, what they hear, what they've learned. Help them be prepared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wanted to start out with, I love parables of Jesus, and there's this one parable that we're going to dig into, and the reason why I love parables is Jesus often, he's the smartest man, smartest person I know, right, that I can read about, of course he would be, and, and he often comes around a statement, and he says a few things that are completely different than what I would expect when I was reading the parable, and we're going to dig into one of those parables, but in the end, what happens is, when you read it and you dig into it, you go, you know, that was the perfect thing that Jesus would have said. And today we're going to talk about the parable of the shrewd manager. And this is in Luke 16, verses 1 through 7. Let's dig into this and learn about what he's talking about here. So Luke 16, verses 1 through 7. And he was talking to his disciples here. It's a lesson for his disciples. And he said, and he said to his disciples... There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you, no long, you can no longer be a steward. So what he's going to do, he's going to fire this steward. This rich man is going to fire the steward. Let's go on. Then the steward said to himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I, I have resolved what I to do, that when I am put out of stewardship, that they may receive me in this houses. The steward had a plan. We'll read about what the plan was. Okay. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. The steward did this. And he said to them, first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, 100 measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? So he said, 100 measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. This guy was being, well, we'll find about, uh, you guys know the title, shrewd. He was taking this bill and said, well, in fact, the, the, this steward was probably well understood what the, the master had already given him. And he said, that bill that you owe my master, go ahead and write something less so that you don't owe as much. And, and giving the benefit to each one of them. Now, this is Jesus' main point, And we're going to go to Luke 16, verses 8 and 9. So the master commanded Commended, sorry, not com command, commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Then Jesus says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And in 9 he says, And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. And another word for unrighteous mammon is worldly wealth. That when you fail, and another way of saying it is, when it fails, they may receive you in an everlasting home. What's Jesus trying to say here? Shrewd? This was definitely uncharacteristic. I didn't understand that. He's com almost commanded, commending this steward here. Okay? What I'm saying to you today is that Jesus wants us, and through these, these, these two verses, Jesus wants us to innovate not for worldly ideas, but for his message to the world. So let's take a little bit into 8 and talk about that. Just go, we're going to go back to uh, Luke 8 uh, and talk about this. Uh, yeah, 16. Let's go to uh, uh, verse 8 if you can do that. And so it says right here, 
He says right here, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Just to be clear, what is the sons of the world? Sons of the world are those that are after worldly goods. You know, um, they, they are focused on the next buck, how much money I can make. Uh, you, you kind of know that. The other one is the sons of the light, more shrewd than the sons of the light. Who are the shrewd sons of the light? Son, sons of the light are those that are focused on Jesus. Jesus is speaking to us. He wants us to, he wants us here. He's talking directly to us. And what I say is he wants us to innovate for him. How do we do that? How do we innovate for them? And the clue in, in our verse 8 that I say is that he wants us to be sons of the light. How do we become sons of the light? Well, we get to know Jesus. We have to, that's the number one thing I'm going to say today is we need to know Jesus. And there's, there's many ways to know Jesus. There's many paths. But I'm going to focus on three of them. One is that we need to learn our Bibles and, and dig into our Bibles. Number two, prayer. And number three, and we'll talk about as a behavior. Um, when I talk about, to, to work about the first one, you know, God, uh, Paul, we're going to jump over to Ephesians here, and Paul um, is talking about gifts, and every one of us has a spiritual gift. And um, in Ephesians 4, verses, he's talking to Ephesians here, and in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 13, he's talking about how God, how God wants us to use these gifts. And let's read this. And he said to himself, and he, and he himself gave some to the apostles, some to the prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we have come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ." What, you, what Paul's saying is he wants us to use our gifts to edify those into the sons of light. He wants us to teach one another, help one another. And, of course, one of the best ways to do that is to dig into the Word, and that's, that's through this Bible here and through Bible studies. I'm, uh, I'm so proud of my church. Did you know over the last, uh, of this church, you guys, over the last seven weeks, we've actually had, um, we've had three different Bible studies that you could watch on YouTube during the week. Individual Bible studies every week, three of them. Um, I remember three years ago before COVID, we barely could do a live stream out to our, our outside. But now anyone here in our congregation, but also others, could, if you had a need, I need to get into the Bible. I need to learn about Jesus. You had this opportunity to do that. I'll, I'll give a couple shout outs. Of course, the pastor was doing a Revelation Unmasked seminar. It was live streamed and it was a recording on YouTube that you can watch today. He did that for seven weeks. And then, and then the pastor also has a Bible study class pretty much every week when he's here. And it's live streamed and available. And he digs into the Bible, really knowing all, really going that one step further. And really making that Bible come alive. And then, and then we also have our quarterly Bible study class that's been doing, doing videos for the last couple years. And we do it every Thursday. We have a video that we record and it comes out. Um, so neat. So number one, study the Bible. Number two, to get to know Jesus, I say, is prayer. And prayer, I think we all know it. I'm, I'm talking to the choir here. Um, I, there is not a time, that a day that goes by when I remember to pray that after prayer I feel better. After prayer I have a direction that I need to go. When I'm confused, I go prayer and God comes to me um, and it makes a difference. And what I'm going to do next. Prayer is so important. If you need someone to pray, uh, the song before I got up was saying, if you need someone to pray, power of prayer with a group is so powerful. If you need, feel like you need to be anointed or you would like just an elder or someone to pray, please come. Not only does it help you, but it helps you to know about Jesus. And the last thing I'll talk about getting to know Jesus is to, is a behavior. Um, and really, it's a, it's a thing we know about. It's called live by, the, live by the Spirit. Paul talks about this to Galatians, and we're going to jump over to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. It says, 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passionate desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Knowing Jesus, prayer, study, and working on our behaviors by trying to live in the Spirit. Okay, so uh, let's, let's talk about innovating, too. One, as I said about how to know Jesus, that's the most important thing because we've got to be sons, as we saw in, in um, Luke 16, verse 8. We need to be sons of the light. The other one is I want to pull out a really neat story out of the Bible, and this is the story of Joseph. And I will tell you today, I think he's an innovator. I think he, he, he puts this to a head. And um, this story of Joseph has lots of different turns to it. It has a lot of different components. It talks about family dynamics. It talks about envy. Um, it talks about forgiveness. And as you recall, um, Joseph had a, a gift, and he had the gift that he could interpret dreams. And when he was a, a young man, he interpreted the dream that his brothers would ultimately bow down to him. He told this dream to his brothers, and his brothers didn't like that at all. And of course, many of you know that story. He was sold into slavery, and he went into, he went into slavery, and he had to, he traveled all the way to Egypt and was a slave in Egypt. And then, through God's help, and I'm sure some of his help too, is his, his tenacity, he became the manager of his master's house. In fact, he could control, even though he was still a slave, he could control everything in that master's house, except one thing, his wife, his master's wife. And um, as the story goes, his master's wife um, wanted something from Joseph that Joseph could not, did not provide. Um, it was some impropriety. And she ultimately falsely accused Joseph of something, impropriety at that time. I guess he, he was a, a good-looking man at the time. So he went to jail. His master sent him to jail. And in jail, he was there for several years. And even in jail, you see in the Scripture, you see how he became a leader within the, in that, that jail situation. And the guards actually relied on him to help with the other prisoners. In fact, a couple prisoners that came from Pharaoh's court ended up in jail, and they had dreams. And Joseph was right there to help them, and, and he helped them interpret their dreams. And remember, this was the gift that God had given them to interpret their dreams. And, he had, and those two guys, one, he said, you're going to get executed, and he did get executed, unfortunately. The second one was, you're going to go back to Pharaoh's court, and everything's going to be okay. And Joseph being a little innovator, we'll talk more about this. He said, remember me when you get back to Pharaoh's court because I don't want to be in jail anymore. I want to get out of here. So he, uh, he did that. The, the, the guy went back to Pharaoh's court, didn't remember Joseph. So he was in there for a couple more years until Pharaoh had another dream, had a dream, and a dream that no one could interpret. And then this man that was in Pharaoh's court probably wanted to Tried, probably wanted to get good favors with Pharaoh and said, hey, I know this man that interpreted my dreams. He is in jail right now, but go, maybe he could do it. And Joseph then, um, he goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh goes to Joseph, and we're going to read in Genesis 41 to 25, uh, chapter 41, 30, 25 to 32, and this is how Joseph helps Pharaoh. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of the Pharaoh are one. God has shown um, Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing that I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, 
but after them seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Wow. So this was a gift that God had given uh, Joseph to be able to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. He could have left it right there. He could have done it right there. But instead, Joseph innovated. Let's read on. Genesis 41, 33, and 36. Now, therefore, this is Joseph speaking, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. Let them keep food in the cities, that that food shall be a reserve for the land of the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and the land may not perish during the famine. God had given Joseph this gift to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, but he took that and he gave, not only Pharaoh, he told Pharaoh the problem, but he also solved a way to solve that problem. Pharaoh was not a, he wasn't stupid either. And so what did he do? We know the end, almost the end of this story or the middle of this story because there's much more in Joseph's story. But in the middle of this story, what did he do? He said, wow, this man is smart. Let's take him from this prison. Let's make him a ruler over the land and be in charge of these seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And what does that do? How did he help innovate for God? Well, he saved thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives by this. Let's read on. He also, he also saved his brother's lives, the ones that had sold him into slavery. So he saved their lives. Let's read in Genesis 45, verses 4 through 8. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And they came near to him. And he, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because of you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it is not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. How important it was that Joseph, during his struggles, he always had God with him. Remember, I remember the first point of being an innovator, knowing Jesus, staying with him in the Lord. Um, Ellen White takes it one step further in Patriarchs and Prophets, and she writes, The life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. It was envy that moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him as a slave. Um, they hoped to prevent him from becoming greater than themselves. And when he was carried to Egypt, they flattered themselves that they were to be no more troubled with his dreams, that they had removed all the possibility of fulfillment. But their own course was overruled by God to bring about the very event that they designed to hinder. So the Jewish priests... And elders were jealous of, Jesus, of Christ, fearing that he would attract the attention of the people from them. They put him to death to prevent um, him from becoming king, but they were thus bringing about that very result. Now let's read. I want to re return back to Luke 16, verses 9. Remember right at the very beginning that, the, that we talked about. And read once again what Jesus is saying to his disciples about innovating for him. And I say to you, Make friends for yourself by worldly wealth that when it fails, they may receive you in an everlasting home. Well, I say uh, Joseph was a good example of this. So that's good. So how can we innovate? How do we do it? Talked about being knowing Jesus. But the one I'm going to say is that 
doing what we're doing already, working on the ministries that you're in, volunteering maybe for the AV team if you haven't, or joining another ministry, working on the media team, being part of women's ministry or men's ministry, or doing these, these sunshine boxes, okay? It doesn't have to be big. In fact, we're going to learn. Let's go over to Luke, and I'm going to say the small things matter. Luke 16, verses 10. Jesus says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in what is much. On the other hand, he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust as what is much. I'm going to say start with the little things. The little things will build up. Jesus wants us to do that, a step-by-step process. Uh, I remember uh, when, uh, when they were talking about the sunshine boxes up here, this term intentional, being intentional every day, bringing the message of the Lord to your neighbor, um, telling them about that YouTube video. Maybe, maybe bringing the YouTube video into your Bible study class and you guys can, those, on the Bible studies, and learn about what uh, the pastor was talking about in Revelation seminar or what our quarterly was talking about. Being intentional, small things. Uh, I do have a, uh, um, how much time? We're a little bit over. Okay, so we'll do, <laughs> I had another story I could add in there, but it's, it's not, it's not going to add too much to it. The other thing that I want to do is that we're going to keep learning from this. Jesus was full of learning elements here. The other one he wants to know is that, yep, we're in the world, okay? In fact, Jesus is not saying us to get out of the world. He says we're going to be in the world. He just doesn't want us to be of the world. And when he says we're going to be in the world, we're also going to be tempted in this world. But what I'm going to say to you today is this temptation that happens This is an opportunity for growth. And let's look at Luke 16, verses 11 through 12. Jesus, once again, continues with his his instruction. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you your trust, the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? If you guys had any doubt on Jesus is what he was feeling about this rich man or the steward at the beginning of this parable. It is a complete condemnation right here where Jesus is saying here, we need to be faithful and in this, our brothers. We need to be faithful, those things. And we need to use the worldly wealth that we get, those opportunities that we get, to do as much as we can to innovate for Jesus. Um, And this happens every day um, in our jobs during the week. Um, This last week, I don't know about you, I've been been in an industry where um, we sell semiconductors. And I don't know if you've probably seen this in the news, semiconductors have been pretty rare um, in in what we call under allocation. There are many customers that want our parts, and we just can't build them quick enough, fast enough. And so it's a big struggle um, from our position is that yeah, we have those, those things, but we have to figure out who to give it to, okay? And we try to be as fair as possible because we n- realize that if we don't give it to this company, that company might, their factory might stop. Their people may not get any income, okay? They may have to go bankrupt. So we are trying to be very fair and cognitive where we do this. And even this last week, um, one of those companies that we've been working really hard to stay steady, they accused us of impropriety. They accused us of being unfair. They said we weren't doing enough. And it's almost like, man, if they're already accusing me, you know how easy? I'm in a position of, I, we're kind of, we're in a unique position, I understand, but we're in this position where we could take, we could really, you know, kind of move it around, give it to someone else that really saves the benefit but we don't. Those are, those are options where, and it's not just me, it's also the company I work for, you know, where we have that opportunity to help others every week in our day, and opportunities where we're going to be tempted, okay? But I see that those are growth areas, so that, therefore, if you've not been faithful and unrighteous, ma'am, and who will commit you to the trust and to riches? Another one, of course, is Joseph. You know, Joseph, as I said at the beginning of that part of that story, you know, he had become really the manager of his master's house, everything in there. 
And he could have given in to the temptation of Pontifer's wife, his master's wife at that point. And maybe no one, underst- no one would have figured it out. But he didn't. And look at what he achieved because of that. He grew from those cases. Let's keep going. Uh, Joseph, uh, Luke 6, we'll finish this up. Luke 16, verses 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or wealth. And let me put a, let me put a, thing, uh, a comment in here. Now, we've been talking a little bit about wealth, and wealth is definitely an idol. But you could put your idol in there, other idols in there, pleasure, um, significance, power. You can't serve God in power, okay? You can't serve them. It's all God. It's all Jesus. And it's not clear, but somehow the Pharisees, just at the end of this parable, the Pharisees also heard about it. it must have been, they even must have been in the room, or maybe the, the, the disciples said, okay, let's go ahead and tell the Pharisees about this. Um, in Luke 16, verses 14, it says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed in, among men is an abomination in the sight of the God. In summary, to innovate for Jesus comes first by being in the light and knowing him. Okay. Jesus wants us to be in this world, but not of it. And we can do that by focusing our ministries, doing those small things to bring God's message to our fellow neighbors, our family, our community. And know that we're going to be tempted. Um, this world is full of temptations, but by through that, we can grow and get even closer to God and Jesus. Let's be all innovators for Jesus. Thank you.